Hello, and welcome to my presentation on quantum accelerated global constraint filtering. My name is Kyle Booth, and this is joint work with Brian O'Gorman, Jeffrey Marshall, Stuart Hadfield, and Eleanor Riffle. This work is motivated by recent advances in gate model quantum computation. So gate model quantum computers are universal processors, and unlike special purpose processors such as quantum annealers, are capable of implementing any algorithm that can be expressed as a series of quantum logic gates. Research in using gate model quantum computation for accelerating classical algorithms in search and optimization has actually seen a flurry of activity in the literature, with recent contributions for the simplex method, backtracking tree search, and branch and bound. So our group became curious to know and investigate if we could use gate model quantum computation to accelerate constraint programming. In this work, we propose a quantum accelerated filtering algorithm for the all different global constraint. Our algorithm follows the classical algorithm for domain consistency, however it accelerates the various subroutines leveraging existing quantum algorithms for graph problems. Our algorithm improves over the classical worst case complexity by a factor illustrated by this expression here, where the cardinality of x is the number of variables and the cardinality of v is the number of unique domain values. We also extend our results for the all different global constraint to filtering of the global cardinality constraint showing an equivalent improvement in worst case complexity. Lastly, we investigate the use of quantum filtering within a classically managed backtracking search and comment on some of the issues in doing this. I want to note that the algorithms in this presentation require fault tolerant quantum computers beyond what is currently available and thus cannot be immediately implemented. We believe that quantum global constraint filtering is attractive for the CP community as quantum computing can theoretically, as we will show in this presentation, offer significant speed ups. We also believe that this concept is quite attractive for the quantum community because constraint programming, the paradigm of CP, provides a structured way to carve off portions of complex problems that can then be worked on by a quantum coprocessor. Filtering subproblems, just by their nature, require fewer qubits than to solve the entire global problem, and so these filtering subproblems become feasible on earlier, smaller quantum coprocessors. If we look at this figure at the bottom here, um, what we envision is having a classically managed backtracking tree search. So we have a classical processor managing the backtracking tree search. And then at each node, we can accelerate global constraint filtering with a quantum coprocessor that solves a variety of quantum subroutines that allow us to do that quantum global constraint filtering faster. Due to the limited time of this presentation, my goals for this talk are to provide you with intuition for how Grover's search algorithm works, as well as provide you with intuition for how it can be used to accelerate global constraint filtering. Some background on quantum computing. So a qubit is a quantum system with a state described by this expression. We can think of the state of a qubit as being some superposition or linear combination of the classical states zero and one. The linear combination is described by the coefficients a and b, subject to this normalization condition, a squared plus b squared is equal to 1. And commonly, we will, we will refer to these classical 0 and 1 states as the basis vectors of the qubit, um, and these a and b coefficients as the amplitudes. And we'll note that these often can and will take on complex values. We can visualize the state of a qubit um, in this figure here, where on the x-axis we have the classical state 0, on the y-axis we have the classical state 1, and the state of the qubit itself is some linear combination superposition of these two classical states. When we measure a qubit, we are returned with classical information. Um, upon measuring a qubit, we get the state 0 with probability a squared, and state 1 with probability b squared. A quantum register holds the state of n, n qubits. And so the basis vectors for a quantum register are given by this expression, which in the case of a two qubit quantum register um, will be these states here. So we have 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 1. And so we can see that in the case of a two qubit system, our basis is really given by the possible states 
of the you know classical bit strings, so possible states of a classical bit string of length two. The state of the entire quantum system is given by, as a linear combination of each of these basis states. So you can see here we sum across each of the basis states. Again, in the two qubit case, it's these four states. Um, and each of the, st the basis states is multiplied by its amplitude, which is this um, coefficient ax, subject to the normalization condition that all of the amplitudes, when added up, equal 1. And so we can easily map these expressions back to the single qubit case, um, and this still holds. A quantum gate is a state transformation that acts on a quantum register, and a quantum circuit is a sequence of quantum gates. So quantum algorithms can be expressed as quantum circuits, and often when we compare quantum algorithms, we compare them with respect to the number of qubits used, so the space complexity, or the number of gates used, the time complexity. This example up here is a quantum circuit that involves um, a register of two qubits. So we can see we have a two qubit register. Each of the qubits is initialized in the zero state. The horizontal lines indicate the flow of time. We have a single qubit gate acting on the first qubit here and a two qubit gate over here. This entire thing is a quantum circuit. And in this paper, when we talk about complexity, um, we are referring to the time complexity or the, roughly speaking, the number of gates um, used in the quantum algorithm. The next thing I want to talk about is Grover's algorithm. Grover's algorithm is a quantum algorithm that solves the unstructured search problem. The unstructured search problem can be stated as follows. Given a list, an unstructured list of n items, and a predicate such that when we pass the predicate any item, it outputs either a 0 or a 1. What we want to do is we want to find an item x in the unstructured list such that the predicate evaluates to 1 with the fewest queries to the predicate. And so we can imagine classically, in the worst case, we'll actually have to test all of these items before we find the one um, that evaluates to 1 because they're unstructured. So for a predicate with one solution, classically, we need on the order of the number of items uh, queries to the predicate. However, with Grover's algorithm, um, the idea is we only need square root n queries to the predicate. In the quantum case, this is also called an oracle to solve the unstructured search problem. And so we have a um, quadratic speed up um, in the number of queries to the predicate. The way we do this is through... Um, you know, evaluating the predicate on a superposition of states. And another thing is Grover's algorithm is probabilistic in nature, so it has some probability of failure, although there are some variants that are deterministic, which I won't be talking about here. To give you some intuition for how Grover's algorithm works, I'll be using the geometric interpretation. Um, so we initialize, and we initialize the algorithm um, such that our quantum system, our quantum register, is in the uniform superposition state, and each of these search states in our quantum system is going to correspond with one of the items in the unstructured list. And so effectively what we're doing here, if you look at the top figure, is we're assigning a uniform amplitude to each of the search states. In this figure in the middle here, we can see that our uniform superposition state is indicated by the red arrow, um, for the purposes of this example, we're going to let the y-axis represent the solution state that we want to actually find. From the initialized uniform superposition, we're going to apply the Grover circuit, so a series of gates, which is effectively going to query the predicate in superposition. And what that's going to do after the first iteration is it's going to increase the amplitude associated with the solution state and decrease the amplitude associated with all the other states. In terms of this um, graphic in the middle here, we can see that our red vector representing our, the quantum state of our system has now rotated closer to the y-axis that represents the solution state. After another um, iteration of Grover's, um, we can see that the amplitude associated with our solution state has gone up even more, and the other amplitudes have reduced even more, and this red vector is getting even closer to the y-axis. The result of this is after applying a certain number of iterations, when we actually measure the state of our system with high probability, it is going to output 
the state associated with the element in our list that, um, that we want to find. And so indeed, the optimal iterations are um, on the order of square root n. Similarly, we can look for m solutions, where the optimal iterations are going to be square root m times n. Um, however, because now we're um, looking for m solutions to reduce the aggregate error of Grover's algorithm, we repeat each individual search log n times. And so you're actually going to see this log term in a few of the complexity results. Just keep in mind, log basically means repetitions to reduce aggregate error. All right, let's talk about the all different constraint. So all different over a scope of variables, as I'm sure most of you know, um, requires that those variables take on different values. State-of-the-art filtering is given by Regan's algorithm, which given variables x and unique domain values v, gives domain consistency on the order of this expression here. The main components of the all different filtering algorithm are building a variable value graph located on line one, finding a maximum matching in that graph, line two, testing if the matching cardinality is less than the number of variables. If that's the case, then we um, the constraint cannot be satisfied and we initiate a backtrack. If it is the, um, if, however, we have a cardinality matching equal to the number of variables, then we proceed um, to the remove edges function down here. Since the computational brunt of the all different filtering algorithm is actually in finding a maximum matching, um, that's what we're going to focus on in this presentation. The way we do that first is we build a variable value graph. So we have um, variables x1, x2 with um, their respective domains, and our all different constraint is defined on these variables. And so our variable value graph is going to be given by this. So we have our variable nodes on the left-hand side, value nodes on the right-hand side, and the edges indicate the permissible domain or assignments of values to variables. We're going to initialize um, the find max matching subroutine with an empty matching. The find max matching um, state of the art classical algorithm was proposed by Hopcroft in 1973 and later generalized to um, non bipartite graphs by Macaulay and Vizirani in 1980. And I will give a high level description of this algorithm. You might want to pause the video to understand some of the definitions in the lower left here. So first what we're going to do is we start with a variable value graph and an empty matching, and we're going to conduct a breadth first search um, labeling, so a breadth first search starting from exposed vertices and labeling each vertex with a pair of numbers called the even level and the odd level. And so by definition, the even level of an exposed vertex is zero and the odd level of an exposed vertex is infinity. And so we get this labeling scheme here. Our second step is to find so-called bridges. A bridge is an edge whose vertices have either both finite even level or finite odd level. And so we can see that actually all of the edges in this graph are bridges. Um, but let's select this edge at the top here to be the bridge that we then conduct the next step on. So with this bridge, we do a depth first search um, from each of the vertices on either end of the bridge to, expo um, to exposed vertices. And because each of these vertex vertices is an exposed vertex itself, um, the depth first search doesn't actually go anywhere, it just stops at the two vertices um, involved in the bridge. And we have a matching, so this returns a matching now, x1, v1. So we can see after one phase of the algorithm, we've gone from an empty matching to a matching involving this single edge. So this is the end of the first phase. The second phase takes this matching, conducts the same steps, and looks to augment the matching into a larger cardinality matching. So again, breadth first search starting from the exposed vertices, labeling the vertices with even level and odd level. We end up with this labeling scheme. Then we look to find bridges. We'll notice that the only bridge is actually this edge up here. We conduct a depth first search from each of the vertices in the bridge to an exposed vertex. And what we'll end up with is um, a matching consisting of these two edges here with cardinality two, which again is more than the cardinality of the matching we had entering this phase of the algorithm. So this is the end of the second phase of the algorithm. 
Um, and because the cardinality of this matching is actually equal to the number of variables, this is the end of the algorithm. Uh, so to summarize, we have a breadth-first search that looks to label the vertices, and then a depth-first search um, that looks to actually construct the edges in the augmented matching. Um, and yeah. So the complexity of each of the phases is on the order of the number of edges in the graph. So the cardinality of variables times the cardinality of the values. The number of phases required shown by Hopcroft in 1973 is square root the cardinality of x. And so we get the total complexity to be this expression here. Our question is now, can we use a Grover style quantum search to accelerate find max matching? And so the answer is yes. Dorn et al. in 2009 provides a quantum algorithm that accelerates, um, that provides an improved complexity for finding maximum matchings in graphs. The intuition is to use a Grover style search to accelerate the BFS and DFS procedures. So again, Dorn et al. propose a quantum algorithm for finding a maximum matching um, with complexity equivalent to this expression here. Again, the log terms here um, are repetitions to get the errors down to, uh, the aggregate error down to a constant. Um, Dorn et al. assumes that oracle queries are done in constant or log time. And we actually show in the paper that this is reasonable with the use of something called quantum random access memory. So see the paper for more details on that. And this quantum algorithm improves over the classical case by a factor of um, this expression up to polylogarithmic terms. To give you some intuition for how um, this quantum fine max matching works, uh, so essentially we use Grover style search to accelerate DFS and BFS. So let's consider DFS for example. Um, we have a DFS where some of the vertices in the graph have already been visited by the algorithm. From a given vertex, we want to find an unvisited adjacent vertex. So we have a vertex V, it has a series of adjacent vertices, um, all the way up to DV, which represents the degree of V. And what we want to do is we want to find the next node to go through in our DFS, such that the node we go to hasn't actually already been visited. Classically, in the worst case, we're going to need to check um, each adjacent vertex. So the complexity of this operation is on the order of the degree of that node. And if we sum this over all of the vertices in the graph, we end up with a procedure on the order of the number of edges in the graph. In the quantum case, however, we can actually search over the adjacent vertices in superposition, thinking back to the um, Grover search explanation slides. So in the worst case, we actually only need on the order of square root the degree of V queries um, to our oracle. And so overall, when we aggregate over all of the vertices, we have a complexity of this depth first search of on the order of uh, square root nm, where n is the number of vertices. And clearly we can see that this is an improvement over the classical um, way of doing things. We can also show a similar result for breadth first search. Some other contributions in the paper, um, we detail a quantum algorithm to accelerate remove edges in some cases. Um, this also uses uh, you know, Grover style search to accelerate some of the unstructured searching. We show that essentially that it doesn't always provide a speed up. Um, we also extend our all different approach to the um, global cardinality constraint um, following some uh, fairly recent work. We show that um, uh, our approach to all different can actually also be used to accelerate the filtering of GCC. So see the paper for more details there. The last thing I want to talk about is quantum filtering in the context of backtracking search. As I said before, um, you know, Grover search ha is probabilistic. It has some probability of failure, even though this um, probability is usually quite small. Um, if we want to maintain the completeness of our search, we do need to account for the fact that, you know, the Grover style search may fail every now and then. So if we consider using the quantum find max matching algorithm at a node in our search, the input to quantum find max matching is our variable value graph. The output is going to be a um, matching M. And what we're going to do is we're going to classically check whether A, that the matching is, you know, a valid matching. And then we're going to ask whether the cardinality of that matching is equal to the number of variables in the problem. In the case that it isn't, we're actually going to have to verify this result by running classical find max matching. And this is because um, the quantum algorithm may have told us that the maximum cardinality matching was less than the number of variables. 
However, this could have been due to error. So we're going to need to validate the result with classical fine max matching. And so at these nodes, we don't actually get any speed up. If this condition is satisfied, so we have a classically verified matching with cardinality equal to the number of variables, then we can proceed with remove edges and we get a quantum speed up um, for this particular case. And so in general, we get a speed up on average for nodes that have a matching m is equal to x or cardinality of m is equal to cardinality of x. And then we do not get a speed up for nodes that do not have such a matching. So this is kind of the flavor of the sort of thing that might need to be applied um, when using quantum filtering and backtracking search. So in this work, we proposed a quantum accelerated filtering algorithm for the cons domain consistency of all different. Um, and then we discussed, you know, using quantum filtering in a classically managed backtracking tree search. Uh, we believe the CP paradigm is well positioned to benefit from progress in fault tolerant quantum computing. Um, you know, modular nature of CP allows quantum coprocessors to basically work on these smaller filtering subproblems. And as part of future work, we're currently investigating um, other global constraints and fully quantum backtracking search. Thank you for your time.